This is section zero, introduction of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Greenman. The complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. Introduction by Walter Raleigh. It would have given no displeasure to Sir George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax, to think that by later generations of his countrymen he should be almost forgotten. Statesmen are easily forgotten. A prosperous lie made Titus Oates immortal. But the man who was the practical genius of the English Revolution, and the acutest critical genius among English politicians, is now little more than a name what is most commonly remembered about him is that he was called the trimmer the nickname was put upon him angrily by his contemporaries and was worn proudly by himself the imputation it conveyed was no doubt that he trimmed his sails to the varying breezes of opinion but in his famous pamphlet the noise of which still echoes distantly in the public ear he changed the metaphor a boat he said goes ill and is in danger of capsizing if the people in it weigh it down all on one side or all on the other but there is a kind of men who conceive that it would do as well if the boat went even without endangering the passengers and it is hard to imagine he adds how it should come to be a fault or a heresy to attempt to trim the boat he calls it a boat he never uses magnificent or extravagant language but what he means is the ship of state that ship on whose seaworthiness the lives even of the mutineers depend halifax was a pilot for the greater part of his responsible life and his chief care was always the state his reputation has none of that glamour which shines upon heroic folly the leader of a forlorn hope excites a ready enthusiasm the martyr for an idea the rebel who will have his own way or nothing the stickler for principle who cares little to stay in a world where his darling creed is not to prevail all these are easily made into heroes and worshipped for their courage but the pilot to whom danger and difficulty are not heroic crises but the very material of his craft or the engine driver who has had the care of a thousand lives in his sole charge goes home unnoticed and takes his modest wage on his constancy and judgment the safety of humanity depends his faith and skill have made it possible for the thoughtless passengers to dream in peace and to warm their imagination with the admirable deeds of fiction life would be a poorer thing than it is if work of this kind were rewarded by monuments and testimonials and public fame the old roman way is better expect the best from your political servants and try them for treason if they give you less not many men have written books on the practical business of their lives statesmen have commonly been content to make laws or treaties leaving it to philosophers to expound the principles of politics it is the fascination of the writings of halifax that they were suggested by his experience of life and are crammed with the lessons drawn directly from that experience here are no flights of the imagination no ingenious ornaments of style no beautiful vanities of authorship he quotes none of those fallacious historical precedents which are dear to the mind of the academic scholar his writings are bare of classical illusion what he has to tell is what he has found out for himself in the course of his traffic with the world but he tells it with so much wit and irony with such acuteness of observation and pungency of phrasing that he runs some risk of losing the esteem of those who think that wise men must needs be dull moreover books have failed from time immemorial to convey the lessons of experience 
and the wisdom of life can be bought only by the expenditure of life itself old men would be very glad to tell what they know but they cannot hope to be understood if they are wise they say little if they are foolish they babble pleasantly enough but have nothing to tell halifax has much to tell but a beginner is not likely to learn it on the other hand a man who has served on a jury or has stood an election or has been responsible for the management of any business will feel a thrill of pleasure when his own experience is brought home to him again in that brilliant epigrammatic dress english literature is very rich only a very rich literature could have afforded to neglect so distinguished a writer but it is not rich in practical wisdom and the neglect of halifax is a thing to be regretted and amended his writings are strangely modern and withal are wholly english the politics of this country have altered very little one would say since the days of the exclusion bill indeed it is one of the chief attractions of seventeenth-century history that there is hardly a live question to-day which was unknown to the men of that time it is something to feel that we are not more fantastic or absurd than our ancestors any one who reads the pamphlets which contain halifax's reflections on the controversies of his own time will find himself almost against his will applying these reflections to the matter of to-day no violence is required to make the application page after page of the pamphlets might have been written yesterday for all the evidence that they show of bygone modes it is a fashion nowadays to decry the party system in politics once upon a time so the argument runs party names stood for something real they marked fundamental and irreconcilable differences of opinion on essential questions but now they have become empty of meaning the pretexts of competitors for power and reward such an account of the party system is not good history swift who lived when the succession to the crown was a party question made light of whig and tory and here at the very birth of the system is halifax its most destructive critic the names of whig and tory do not occur in his works he disliked devotion in a conventicle and loyalty in a drunken club he was troubled to see men of all sides sick of a calenture he knew that men though they forget much never forget themselves and that the world is nothing but vanity cut out into several shapes his remarks of parties in his political thoughts and reflections are the severest things ever said about party it turneth all thought into talking instead of doing men get a habit of being unuseful to the public by turning in a circle of wrangling and railing which they cannot get out of ignorance maketh most men go into a party and shame keepeth them from getting out of it the fact is that the rigors of party which are easily maintained with all their consequences by logicians journalists and theorists will not suffer the practical test men exalt themselves on their principles and glory in the partition which separates the sheep from the goats who prove after all to be only the other sheep but the english have a genius for government and when government is the business in hand this separatist method has no value men who differ rabidly on principles will find that the lessons they learn from experience have a tendency to be the same then if they change their course or modify the policy which has been so bravely announced they are accused of being false the charge is true they have been false but it was their thinking and talking that was false not their corrected action the melodrama of their boastful creed would not bear translation into the life of this world they have been the dupes of literature 
all that is heroic in literature is simple and straightforward but then the hero is prepared to die society is not prepared to die for a creed and politics is a vast complex network of means to an end the end being the continued life and comfort of mankind it is the irony of the statesman's position that while his work is very like the work of a good housekeeper the literary deceits and fictions incident to the process of persuasion invite us to regard him as a hero of romance a lone figure on a mountain peak silhouetted against the moon i think it's the novels said the old lady quoted by mr badgett that make my girls so heady the old political families of england who have borne a hand for generations in the government of the country are often exempt from these errors they are not easily intoxicated by public duties which have been their matter-of-fact business for centuries you may call them whig or tory it makes little difference some third name more fundamental in its implications is needed to describe them they look at things instinctively from the point of view of the administration the fervors of the pulpit and the platform do not much delight them it was the great advantage of george savile that he was born into such a family and was connected by kinship or by the accidents of life with many of the most influential persons of that age sir henry savile wit and scholar warden of merton college oxford and provost of eton perhaps the most learned greek scholar of elizabethan england was his distant kinsman the lord keeper coventry was his grandfather the great earl of strafford was his father's uncle anthony ashley cooper first earl of shaftesbury who vies with one other claimant for the credit of being the first whig was his uncle by marriage his colleague and in the end his rival lady dorothy sidney waller's saccharissa was his wife's mother more notable still the famous earl of chesterfield was his grandson in short he was intimately connected with most of those whose names fill the pages of english history during the latter part of the seventeenth century and was a witness of the events of that history from a position of extraordinary vantage his family moreover though staunchly royalist managed to keep possession of its estates and in sixteen forty three when his father sir william savile after loyal service rendered to the king died at the age of thirty-one the young george savile had the ball at his feet concerning his youth and education we know next to nothing he was born in sixteen thirty three and was brought up under the control of his widowed mother who was a woman of strong character when she died in sixteen sixty two her son was already married settled on his estate of rufford in nottingshire and prominent in public life note one all who concern themselves with halifax must acknowledge their great debt to the careful and exhaustive work of miss foxcroft the life and letters of sir george savile bart first marquis of salifax etc with a new edition of his works now for the first time collected and revised by h c foxcroft two volumes longmans eighteen ninety eight end of note one he was described later by evelyn the diarist as a very rich man very witty and in his younger days somewhat positive his wit and his riches he kept throughout life his opinions became less positive his wit was perhaps his chief fault he could not keep it under or refuse himself a pointed jest one great argument says a contemporary account of the prodigious depth and quickness of his sense is that many of his observations and wise sayings were on the sudden when talking to a friend or going from him the spontaneity and freedom of his talk was ill taken by clarendon and other cautious and explanatory persons and savile was reputed to be void of all sense of religion which he certainly was not later among his moral thoughts and reflections he says 
there is so much danger in talking that a man strictly wise can hardly be called a sociable creature this was a lesson that he learned but slowly if indeed he ever learned it his conduct of business was discreet almost to a fault his letters are so prudent and reserved that they are amazingly dull to read but he indemnified himself for these restraints by the freedom of his intimate conversation the writings in which he has allowed himself most of this freedom were either non-political like his advice to a daughter or were posthumously published like his character of king charles the second and political moral and miscellaneous thoughts and reflections these are the best of his works that prudence and discretion which keeps a man safe and sequestered in life conceals him also from the notice of later generations the same caution which delivers him from malicious gossip puts him beyond the reach of posthumous sympathy halifax the author appeals to our interest because he says many things which politicians know and do not say to avoid even paltry enmities may be the clear duty of a statesman it is a misfortune halifax remarks for a man not to have a friend in the world but for that reason he shall have no enemy the events of his public life as parliamentary leader as minister under charles the second as president of the council under james the second and as lord privy seal under william the third are written broad on the history of england and cannot be recorded here he bore a hand in all the chief events of the time from the restoration onwards to his death in sixteen ninety five his importance may be well measured by this that it never depended on the office that he held he was respected consulted and feared in opposition no less than when he was chief minister of the crown the greatest of his achievements it will probably be agreed was the rejection of the exclusion act in sixteen eighty by the house of lords no record remains of the speeches made but the severity and brilliance of his duel with shaftesbury is attested by many contemporaries he stood up to shaftesbury and answered him every time he spoke he carried the house in the end triumphantly with him it was a triumph not so much of argument as of intelligence and insight he understood the temper of the people of england as shaftesbury never did and he knew that the ebullitions of popular enthusiasm are no safe index to that temper monmouth was adored by the people the duke of york was neither liked nor loved shaftesbury thought to earn the nation's gratitude by offering them monmouth in place of york he miscalculated cruelly the people did not fear a new king but they did fear a king-maker the whole edifice of constitutional monarchy was designed not for the protection of bad kings but for the humiliation of arrogant ministers this halifax understood so he became the guardian of the constitution and later when james the second had set himself to break the constitution the guiding spirit of the revolution his politics are our politics his political creed remains in the twentieth century what it was in the seventeenth century the creed of john bull but the rare delight is to find john bull a wit wit is commonly employed in extremes where it works most easily to satirize novelty and ridicule all that is unfamiliar or reversing the process to ridicule all that is familiar to deny the truth of proverbs and to flout the sayings that embody general opinion these devices furnish wit with a simple and effective mechanism but halifax employs the subtlest resources of wit in defense of the practical expedient the middle course the reasonable compromise dryden pays tribute in absalom and achitophel not only to the wit of halifax but to his courage and eloquence jotham of piercing wit and pregnant thought endued by nature and by learning taught to move assemblies who but only tried the worse awhile then chose the better side 
nor chose alone but turned the balance too so much the weight of one brave man can do indeed for all that he is called the trimmer halifax has been very generally recognized for an upright and honorable man he was promoted by steady gradation to high honors and high offices yet no one has been found foolish enough to pretend that he was a self-seeker macaulay who expresses some distrust of him in the essays and introduces him in the history as one who was not sufficiently indifferent to titles of honor makes amends in a later passage by a full and generous eulogy what distinguishes him from all other english statesmen is this that through a long public life and through frequent and violent revolutions of public feeling he almost invariably took that view of the great question of his time which history has finally adopted he was called inconstant because the relative position in which he stood to the contending factions was perpetually varying as well might the pole star be called inconstant because it is sometimes to the east and sometimes to the west of the pointers to have defended the ancient and legal constitution of the realm against a seditious populace at one conjunction and against a tyrannical government at another to have been the foremost champion of order in the turbulent parliament of sixteen eighty and the foremost champion of liberty in the servile parliament of sixteen eighty five to have been just and merciful to roman catholics in the days of the popish plot and to the exclusionists in the days of the rye house plot to have done all in his power to save both the head of stafford and the head of russell this was a course which contemporaries heated by passion might not unnaturally call fickle but which deserves a very different name from the later justice of posterity one stain and one only macaulay finds on his memory that in the reign of william the third he stooped to hold communication with the exiled court of st germain the fact is not disputed but a wise judgment on the fact asks for a more active and careful imagination than is usually brought to it the black-and-white school of moralists are not valuable critics of the politics of the seventeenth century they would be better employed in writing laudatory biographies of the authors of histriomastics and greek title royal icon for many years it was not certain who was king of england it was not certain whether england was to be a monarchy or a commonwealth many patriotic englishmen had been driven abroad and hardly a man of note had not relatives in france in these civil conflicts which divide families the law of treason must needs be humanely interpreted and the offence proved against halifax amounts only to misprision of treason that is to say he did not cut off all confidential relations with his friends and acquaintance on the other side this at any rate is certain he never for one moment sought any other end than the security and greatness of england he very early recognized that one portentous question was beginning to obscure the whole political horizon the greatness of france wrote the english envoy at lisbon as i have heard your lordship observe hath made all old politics useless so in sixteen sixty eight he welcomed the triple alliance between england holland and sweden to hold louis the fourteenth in check so far his politics were the politics of william of orange but william of orange was a european statesman and general halifax was purely an englishman he was glad to have the help of alliances but he did not like to have to trust to them real friendships between nations are things of very slow and difficult growth while friendships between governments are subject to the dangers and disadvantages of friendships between two bodies of trustees representing different interests if such friendships are immutable they are dishonest halifax was not deceived by them in a letter to sir william temple written shortly before the triple alliance was concluded 
he discusses the possibility of a french invasion and concludes we must rely upon the oak and courage of england to do our business there being small appearance of anything to help us from abroad many fine things have been said of england by englishmen none of them more sincere and moving than the things said by halifax he is a quiet writer critical and sceptical keenly aware of the absurdity of enthusiasm he keeps his feelings so well in hand that he has the reputation of a cynic but this is how he writes of england our trimmer is far from idolatry in other things in one thing only he cometh near it his country is in some degree his idol he doth not worship the sun because tis not peculiar to us it rambles about the world and is less kind to us than others but for the earth of england though perhaps inferior to that of many places abroad to him there is divinity in it and he would rather die than see a spire of english grass trampled down by a foreign trespasser he thinketh there are a great many of his mind for all plants are apt to taste of the soil in which they grow and we that grow here have a root that produceth in us a stalk of english juice which is not to be changed by grafting or foreign infusion and i do not know whether any thing less will prevail than the modern experiment by which the blood of one creature is transmitted into another according to which before the french blood can be let into our bodies every drop of our own must be drawn out of them when these words were written england stood in greater danger of invasion than she has known at any later time unless it were in the time of napoleon halifax had seen the navy driven off the sea by the dutch and the shipping in the thames burnt yet the people were slow to awake to their danger in the pamphlet entitled a rough draft of a new model at sea which was published in sixteen ninety four but was probably written earlier he tries to awaken them he knew the difficulty of the attempt a nation is a great while he observes before they can see and generally they must feel first before their sight is quite cleared this maketh it so long before they can see their interest that for the most part it is too late for them to pursue it if men must be supposed always to follow their true interest it must be meant of a new manufactory of mankind by god almighty there must be some new clay the old stuff never yet made any such infallible creature yet the means to safety was clear and he puts it in the forefront of his argument i will make no other introduction to the following discourse than that as the importance of our being strong at sea was ever very great so in our present circumstances it is grown to be much greater because as formerly our force of shipping contributed greatly to our trade and safety so now it is become indispensably necessary to our very being it may be said now to england martha martha thou art busy about many things but one thing is necessary to the question what shall we do to be saved in this world there is no other answer but this look to your moat the first article of an englishman's political creed must be that he believeth in the sea etc without that there needeth no general counsel to pronounce him incapable of salvation here this is all very modern and so also are his recommendations in the matter of commissions in the navy it is perhaps no bad vindication of his opinions that they are in complete agreement with the best practice of the navy from that time to this there were those who held that all naval officers should be gentlemen born as there were others who held that they should all be tarpaulins that is men who had been bred from boyhood to the rough work of practical seamen 
he discusses the merits and faults of both sorts of officer and rejects both proposals as evil extremes there must be a mixture he holds of the two classes in a proportion to be determined by experiment and circumstance and the dangers that may attend the mixture are to be avoided by one main precaution the gentlemen shall not be capable of bearing office at sea except they be tarpaulins too that is to say except they are so trained up by a continued habit of living at sea that they may have a right to be admitted free denizens of wapping there must be an end of sending idle young noblemen to sea in positions of authority when a gentleman is preferred at sea the tarpaulin is very apt to impute it to friend or favor but if that gentleman hath before his preferment passed through all the steps which lead to it so that he smelleth as much of pitch and tar as those that were swaddled in sailcloth his having an escutcheon will be so far from doing him harm that it will set him upon the advantage ground it will draw a real respect to his quality when so supported and give him an influence and authority infinitely superior to that which the mere seaman can ever pretend to a sailor can never be fit to command till he has learned to obey nor can he be trusted to inflict punishment to which he has never been liable when the undistinguished disciple of a ship hath tamed the young mastership which is apt to arise from a gentleman's birth and education he then groweth proud in the right place and valueth himself first upon knowing his duty and then upon doing it the experience of the two wars with holland had plentifully illustrated the evils of which halifax speaks it was his own knowledge of human nature which directed him so clearly to the remedy the works of halifax all belong to the last ten years or so of his life the earliest of them the character of a trimmer is a complete handbook to the politics of the closing years of charles the second's reign the letter to a dissenter and the anatomy of an equivalent which followed it within a few months are directed against james the second's famous attempt to buy off the hostility of the dissenters by including them in his project of toleration none of these tracts when first printed bore the author's name the naval tract mentioned above and the tract entitled some cautions offered to the consideration of those who are to choose members to serve for the ensuing parliament are also anonymous and are his latest writings when the ensuing parliament came to be elected he had been six months dead all his worldly wisdom shines in this last tract which again applies almost without change to the circumstances of the day the last satirical injunction has a strangely familiar ring in the meantime after having told my opinion who ought not to be chosen if i should be asked who ought to be my answer must be choose englishmen and when i have said that to deal honestly i will not undertake that they are easy to be found in some ways his advice to a daughter which alone among the writings published during his lifetime seems to have been carefully prepared by his own hand for the press is the most attractive of his works it was written for his daughter elizabeth who became the wife of the third earl of chesterfield and the mother of a famous son the habit of giving advice to the younger generation would appear to have been hereditary in the family but halifax's social maxims are more profound than chesterfield's as his political maxims are more profound than bolingbroke's the book was immensely popular it ran through some twenty-five editions and held the field for almost a century to be superseded at last by dr gregory's father's legacy and mrs chapone's letters on the improvement of the mind the advice is somewhat melancholy in tone the author sets before his daughter no ideas of self-advancement and indulges her with scant hopes of happiness 
there is too little room in his scheme for the holiday virtues and the free play of impulse whilst you are playing full of innocence the spiteful world will bite except you are guarded by your caution his words are prophylactic against the inevitable ills of life his section on a husband is devoted mainly to considerations which may palliate a husband's faults and vices his commandments are commandments without promise there is to be no relaxation life is one long fencing bout you are to have as strict a guard upon yourself amongst your children as if you were amongst your enemies this is a wide remark but it does not make home seem a place of warmth and ease the same cold good sense and discernment govern his thinking on such topics as religion and friendship he is judicious sane and balanced but he does not think of the world as a cheerful place yet with all this there is something very moving in his solicitude his high principles of conduct and his deep affection for his daughter peep out unwittingly here and there it is small wonder that the book was cherished by her and lay always upon her table the calm of the perfectly well-bred style forbids all direct expression of the emotions but the impression it makes is all the greater when my fears prevail i shrink as if i was struck at the prospect of danger to which a young woman must be exposed his concluding advice on the article of marriage has a pathos of its own that you would as much as nature will give you leave endeavor to forget the great indulgence you have found at home after such a gentle discipline as you have been under everything you dislike will seem the harsher to you the tenderness we have had for you my dear is of another nature peculiar to kind parents and differing from that which you will meet with first in any family into which you shall be transplanted and yet they may be very kind too and afford no justifiable reason to you to complain you must not be frightened with the first appearances of a differing scene for when you are used to it you may like the house you go to better than that you left and your husband's kindness will have so much advantage of ours that we shall yield up all competition and as well as we love you be very well contented to surrender to such a rival something of the same fragrance makes itself felt in the worldly wisdom of his advice concerning censure the triumph of wit is to make your good nature subdue your censure to be quick in seeing faults and slow in exposing them you are to consider that the invisible thing called a good name is made up of the breath of numbers that speak well of you so that if by a disobliging word you silence the meanest the gale will be less strong which is to bear up your esteem and though nothing is so vain as the eager pursuit of empty applause yet to be well thought of and to be kindly used by the world is like a glory about a woman's head tis a perfume she carrieth about with her and leaveth wherever she goeth tis a charm against ill-will malice may empty her quiver but cannot wound the dirt will not stick the jests will not take without the consent of the world a scandal doth not go deep it is only a slight stroke upon the injured party and returneth with the greater force upon those that gave it the character of king charles the second is a masterpiece perhaps no such intimate portrait of an english king drawn by a contemporary is to be found in the whole course of our history it makes us regret that halifax has left us so few descriptions of the persons whom he knew the tendency to aphorism and epigram is strong and the character is full of brilliant sentences men given to dissembling are like rooks at play they will cheat for shillings they are so used to it 
mistresses are in all respects craving creatures but the dispassionate analysis of the king's character and motives the accounts given of the effect of his early misfortune on his disposition and the incidental pictures for those who read between the lines of the daily life of the court all these are as convincing as a scientific demonstration the king's ruling passion the love of ease was never so vividly drawn nothing to him was worth purchasing at the price of a difficulty we see him surrounded by a crowd of importunate beggars of both sexes he would walk fast to avoid being engaged by them he would slide from an asking face and could guess very well when he was brought to bay he would buy off his tormentors by large concessions for the sake of present ease in this way the king was made the instrument to defraud the crown which is somewhat extraordinary it is plain to see for all the delicacy with which the royal foibles are described that lord halifax was not perfectly happy in the familiar company that the king kept about him his mistresses were such as did not care that wit of the best kind should have the precedence in their apartments the king delighted in broad illusions and made fun of those who would not join in he had a good memory but told stories too often and at too great length he appreciated wit but and here is a cry from the soul of all men that ever liked those who had wit he could the best endure those who had none yet the natural amiability and sweetness of charles's temper shines through all the description there is a certain attractiveness in his impatience of the formalities of his position his tendency to relapse into charles stuart and so regain the freedom of a private estate the closing eulogy on this unfortunate and gentle prince is a sincere and true testimony from a competent witness a prince neither sharpened by his misfortunes whilst abroad nor by his power when restored is such a shining character that it is a reproach not to be so dazzled with it as not to be able to see a fault in its full light he is under the protection of common frailty that must engage men for their own sakes not to be too severe where they themselves have so much to answer the political moral and miscellaneous thoughts and reflections is the most notable english collection of maxims the nearest parallel and rival to the work of la rochefoucauld and la bruyere popular proverbs it has often been remarked are not very generous in their treatment of humanity and a writer of aphorisms which are proverbs coined in a private mint is open to the same charge an aphorism is an act of judgment and so can pretend to no higher merit than justice which is not the greatest of human virtues the beauties of human character are vague and living things the deformities lend themselves more readily to be outlined by a decisive pencil yet the aphorisms of halifax never sacrifice sense to wit and always provoke thought his political reflections especially could only have been written by a statesman of experience he is often severe but he is no cynic men must be saved in this world he says by their want of faith but he was not so foolish as to deny the existence of unselfishness it is a mistake to say a friend can be bought in his character of king charles the second commenting on the insatiability of the king's followers he falls into the same vein of argument i am of an opinion in which i am every day more confirmed by observation that gratitude is one of those things that cannot be bought it must be born with men or else all the obligations in the world will not create it an outward show may be made to satisfy decency and to prevent reproach 
but a real sense of a kind thing is a gift of nature and never was nor can be acquired yet even sincere friendship has its weaknesses those friends who are above interest are seldom above jealousy the aphorisms of halifax are a better guide to the world as it is than all the brilliances of his epigrammatic french contemporaries his satire bears no trace of disappointed ambition or poisoned egotism some of his sayings are condensed treatises in their weight of thought why is it that popularity is so often suspect he puts his finger at once on the answer popularity is a crime from the moment it is sought it is only a virtue when men have it whether they will or no who has ever defined a fool better than in these words a fool hath no dialogue within himself the first thought carrieth him without the reply of a second how could the verdict of mankind on plaintive persons be more truly expressed than in the sentences on complaint complaining is a contempt upon one's self it is an ill sign both of a man's head and of his heart a man throweth himself down whilst he complaineth and when a man throweth himself down no body careth to take him up again there is very little mention made of halifax in the writings of his contemporaries though he held a conspicuous station he seems to have passed through life observing rather than observed a fascinating sketch of him is given in burnett's history of his own time as he appeared to that prelate of unbounded energy and coarse perceptions virtue may win over vice but intelligence cannot make a convert of stupidity burnett whose power in the state came late in halifax's career is a good example of the bluff hot-headed partisan to whom it is impossible to doubt that right is all on one side halifax we are told by a contemporary was never better pleased than when he was turning bishop burnett and his politics into ridicule burnett's verdict on halifax will not mislead those who have heard the trimmer speak for himself he was a man of a great and ready wit full of life and very pleasant much turned to satire he let his wit run much on matters of religion so that he passed for a bold and determined atheist though he often protested to me he was not one and said he believed there was not one in the world he was a christian in submission he believed as much as he could and he hoped that god would not lay it to his charge if he could not digest iron as an ostrich did nor take into his belief things that must burst him if he had any scruples they were not sought for nor cherished by him for he never read an atheistical book in a fit of sickness i knew him very much touched with a sense of religion i was then often with him he seemed full of good purposes but they went off with his sickness he was always talking of morality and friendship he was punctual in all payments and just in all his private dealings but with relation to the public he went backwards and forwards and changed sides so often that in conclusion no side trusted him he seemed full of commonwealth notions yet he went into the worst part of king charles reign he is the last of the long line of statesmen who found it possible to govern england without paying allegiance to a party their day is past and the party system is stronger now than it was in the time of the jacobites and hanoverians no better method has ever been devised for the peaceful settlement of differences of opinion on domestic questions the nation is not prepared to revive the custom of impeaching unpopular ministers Englishmen sometimes rail at party as they rail at cricket and football but they know that there is no escape from it it deceives vainglorious partisans no doubt and it offends righteous philosophers but it suits the national temper yet there is no need to be duped by it and any one who tries to think clearly on politics must be a very wise man 
or a very foolish one, if he gets no help from the writings of the Marquis of Halifax. It remains to say a few words on the text of Halifax. The present edition is based on the two volumes which together contain the works of Halifax, namely the volume of Miscellanies, first published in 1700, and the volume entitled A Character of King Charles the Second, and Political, Moral, and Miscellaneous Thoughts and Reflections, published in 1750. For these last two pieces, the 1750 volume is the sole authority. It was printed for material supplied by Lady Burlington, Halifax's granddaughter, and seems to be virtually free from mistakes. The Advice to a Daughter, which is included in the miscellanies, is likewise a good and careful text. Some few variations occur among the many editions of this piece, but they are of very little importance. Of the political tracts there are, of course, many separate editions earlier than the miscellanies. These tracts were most of them first circulated in manuscript, and I cannot convince myself that any one of them, when it came to be printed, was overseen by the author. It may be, as Miss Foxcroft suggests, that he corrected the proofs of the anatomy of an equivalent, but against this it must be said that men of quality rarely corrected proofs, and that the character of a trimmer, a much more important and personal document, appeared in print again and again during his lifetime, full of nonsensical mistakes, which varied from edition to edition, but did not diminish in number. There is no authoritative edition of any of the controversial writings, but the variations in the earlier editions of the shorter tracts are unimportant, and the obvious blunders are comparatively few. The only serious textual difficulties are presented by the character of a trimmer. This piece seems, from the first, to have been the plaything of copyists and printers. Miss Foxcroft, in her admirable edition, has collated the various printed texts, and has compared them in detail with four manuscript copies. But the manuscripts are not more trustworthy or less corrupt than the printed editions, so that the result is disappointing. Some of the best emendations in her text are suggested by herself. Some are borrowed from manuscripts. I desire to express my obligations for the readings which I owe to her edition, notably discountenance for distinct name, infra, page 58, L21, and, best of all, spire of English grass for piece of English glass, page 97, L18. This last emendation has restored its highest touch of imagination to the finest passage in the tract. I have resisted the temptation to suggest important emendations. Once only I have yielded to it, and have read Landlord for Language on page 84, L20. The reading Language would leave to the sentence a possible meaning, but would make nonsense of the argument. It is a significant fact that this reading, which I take to be an obvious blunder, is found in all the editions, and in all the manuscripts. Miss Foxcroft has taken a hint from the manuscripts, and has restored the inflection eth, or th, in the third person singular of the present tense. In this I have followed her example. There is no doubt that the termination in s, or s, was substituted by the printers for the old-fashioned usage, which was preferred by Halifax in his authoritative works, and which is necessary for the cadence of his sentences. I have followed my printed originals in the matter of capitals and italics. I have also preserved the old punctuation, correcting it only in those few instances where it seemed to be wrong judged by its own principles. The modern usage in all these matters sacrifices everything to naked logic, and substitutes bare outline for the delicate emotional shading of the older fashion. Walter Raleigh, Oxford, 1912 End of Introduction to the Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquess of Halifax Read by John Greenman